Hello everybody, let us consider the relations between the embryo, its fetal membranes, namely the amnion and the chorion, the amniotic fluid, the umbilicus and the placenta. So in a simplified scheme, we have an embryo, with the umbilicus, the inner fetal membrane is called the amnion, and I it encircles a space called the amniotic cavity. The amniotic cavity is filled with an amniotic fluid. The am amnion consists of the amniotic epithelium, which is a simple squamous epithelium, and an underlying layer of extraembryonic mesenchyma. This later on fuses with the extraembryonic mesenchyma of the outer fetal membrane called the chorion. So let's add the chorion, which is a smooth part. And in the placenta region, it forms the villi. The real architectonics of the villi is, of course, much more detailed, completed, and branched in more generations. This is just an oversimplification. So this is the there will be the amniotic epithelium here. Supported by a thin layer of extraembryonic mesenchyma. And together they form the amnion which is the inner fetal membrane. It grows together with the chorion. The chorion has is the outer fetal membrane and it has two regions. The chorion levi which is from Latin means in, means smooth, without villi, and the chorion frondosum. Sorry. Which is the region with the chorionic villi that contribute to the fetal part of the placenta. I'm not including the maternal component of the placenta for this purpose. The extraembryonic mesenchyma contains blood, uh, blood vessels and the transudation of the plasma contributes to the formation of the amniotic fluid. However, a really significant contribution is the urine of the embryo or the fetus. So we got this space called the amniotic cavity. Which is filled with amniotic fluid. The volume of the fluid increases. So for example, uh, after 10 weeks, it's roughly 30 milliliters. In the middle of the pregnancy, in the week 20, it's approximately 400, 450 milliliters. And the maximum is in the 37th or 38th week, where the volume 
reaches up to one liter. The volume of the amniotic fluid needs to be proportional to the body size and to the dating, to the age of the pregnancy. This is uh, measured uh, using ultrasonography and the quantity of the amniotic fluid is expressed as the amniotic fluid index which is a score in centimeters and it's like the uh, length of uh, each pocket, each accumulation of amniotic fluid counted over all um, quadrants examined using the ultrasound. The normal or proportional uh, volume of amniotic fluid proportional to the to the age of the pregnancy is called the normal hydramnios. While an, a decreased volume of amniotic fluid is called oligo hydramnios and uh, in case this is uh, diagnosed uh, we need to think for example about uh, developmental defects of kidneys because we know that uh, the urine produced in kidney uh, contributes to the volume of the uh, amniotic fluid. Conversely increased volume of the amniotic fluid is called the polyhydramnios And as we know that the amniotic fluid is swallowed by the fetus and goes through the GIT and is absorbed into the blood plasma and goes to the kidney, etc. So the polyhydramnios might be linked, for example, with uh, with some uh, defects in the GIT. The causes might be diff of these problems might be different and so are the consequences so just know these words for at, at, the, at, the, at, this, at this point. Let's consider the umbilicus. Uh, the umbilicus contains one umbilical vein that carries the blood inside the body and then goes uh, either directly into the inferior vena cava or to the portal vein and it contains two umbilical arteries that come from the internal iliac arteries from the region of the superior vesicle arteries namely and these two arteries are bringing the pressurized blood into the placenta so the umbilical arteries driven by the arterial blood pressure are taking the blood to the placenta and the umbilical vein takes the blood from the placenta back to the to the fetus. Let me label also the extra embryonic mesenchyma here, right? If you'd make a cross section through the umbilicus you would see a histological specimen covered by amniotic epithelium which is simple squamous so one layer of flat cells let me add the nuclei at least to some of the cells. Uh, 
and there will be three blood vessels, two of the same time type, that will be arteries, highly muscular arteries, usually a spastic compress, compressed, which is the natural reaction of the arteries after birth. So it's an artifact actually. In vivo these have widely opened lumen, but now the lumen is constricted by the spasm of the smooth muscle layers. And there is one vein which is um, which does not retain the round shape in histological specimen, but that's an artifact again. For a vein, it's also kind of muscular, but not as much as the arteries are. Of course, they are lined with endothelium. And all vessels are surrounded or embedded within an extremely loose connective tissue, which has few cells, spindle-shaped or star-shaped connective tissue cells, and considerable amounts of uh, glycosaminoglycans, namely the hyaluronic acid. As you might remember from the structure of connective tissue, the hyaluronic acid binds incredible amounts of water. So that gives the tissue a consistency of a jelly. It's semi-transparent with very low rigidity. And it's even named Wharton's jelly. So on the surface we have the amniotic epithelium. Which is simple squamous. Then we got the two, a, p a pair of umbilical arteries, left and right. Umbilical arteries. We got an umbilical vein. Here, and the Wharton's jelly. The spelling is W H A R T O N. Wharton's jelly. With lots of w with with amounts of um, uh, hyaluronic acid. So that's the umbilicus.